you've been working on indicators, alternative indicators for measure, which are looking at environmental issues into economic uh, systems at the center and the state governments. So, what I'd like you to reflect on the practicality of such measures. Also, considering that the MOEF and CC, for example, has taken purposes of the team process and the team thinking, the whole concept, what kind of challenges do you see going forward in the policy making? So, as you can see, these are the main 17 indicators. Within each of these indicators, the number of separate goals that we have, I think, is about 230 of them. But the point with this slide over here that I want to make is that uh, as we're thinking about our development plan and the kind of projects and interventions we need to put in place, I think we should really see the SDGs as a very tremendous opportunity to create a space for India from the perspective of putting the right kind of legislations in place, putting the kind of right measurement metrics in place that can deliver um, equitable growth, that can deliver more poverty alleviation, and can actually deliver more sustainability in the long term because they would preserve our natural resources. So I think the SDG should be seen as an opportunity to structure our growth paradigm and we should think about how we would like to do that. I think we are all really in agreement that GDP is not really the true or right or the right indicator to go with when we are trying to transition towards what we like to call a green economy. And uh, this is basically an economy that's defined as being very focused on, reduce, uh, on delivering social equity when we're talking about growth, but at the same time being very conscious about the fact that we cannot have social equity until we lessen our ecological scarcity. So this is an accepted definition now which has been put forth by the United Nations Environment Program, and that's really the framework upon which a lot of these new indicators which are more sensitive have been built. The second question that I'd like you to ask at some point is the the whole issue on global finance and finance required for uh, SDG implementation. There are innovative mechanisms that a lot of countries are trying now to generate financing to support some of these more uh, health-based programs, environmental-based programs. So for instance, in the United Kingdom, from 2017 onwards, there's going to be a sugar tax. And what this means is that any company that is producing very high content sugar drinks will be taxed higher than other corporations. And it's actually estimated that this will generate 520 million pounds per year for the UK. And what they've decided is that they will use this fiscal resources that they'll be generating in a very sustainable fashion now to develop more health-oriented programs for school going children. And there are a number of other examples that also exist which have been innovative. There's been a lot of work in terms of corporate corporations themselves also looking at their own externality impacts, even in India. But none of these things are mandatory right now. It's pretty much voluntary. So I think some of those kinds of aspects can be looked at in terms of enforcement, in terms of penalties, in terms of seeing how you can even put more incentives in place to get subsidies. Uh, is it two points that that came up was, if I can sort of summarize this, tax the bad and not the good. So if you're taxing sugar, and you're taxing the bad, and you're not taxing the good, and allowing the energy to flow into that. The second point that came in uh, was this whole issue of the GDP of the poor, and we know that extreme poverty is as bad for the environment as affluence is, because they both sort of um, depend and extract um, unsustainably from the natural resources. In this perspective, if we're looking at this country which has probably 300 million in extreme abject poverty, where, you know, so the scale is much higher than what we're talking about in Indonesia. What role does, do you see of the media to build this kind of a discussion? Perhaps no other emerging economy and again, partly to do with our size, partly to do with the degree of variegation we have, have had to engage with such rapid changes in the relationship between the state, the citizen and the executive. And then we have something that we've never engaged with for the past, I guess since independence or before that, an animal that lives within us and we've never tried to engage with when we engage with the larger issues of economies, social development which is caste. 
In that comes a small animal called journalism. And I see journalism in this as nothing more than a storyteller, which is also has a storyteller who has a contract with the citizens <coughs> that you who mostly know more than any journalist allow us as a journalist to come back to you and tell you how your lives are. It's a very weird relationship. And more and more you find that journalism as a profession is unable to deal with the patterns that are emerging. Large institutions like Washington Post, New York Times, even across Europe, Guardian, Le Monde and others if you look, they've scaled down sizes of reportage, of collection of information by almost 10 to 40% over the last decade. At the same time, the amount they need to cover has increased. The volume that they produce has grown anywhere between 5 to 10%. India is weird in that sense. We are growing in terms of social media, we are growing in terms of internet connectivity, we are also growing in terms of print media and we are growing in terms of television media. It's a difficult challenge for us to discuss the relatively SDG process in the process of climate change. If I cannot address how does the caste system fit this? What would happen to the Dalits? What would happen to the tribals who do not even fit into that caste system? Which is, if you see caste system, it is an artificial, irrational method of keeping people away from resources, historically, generation after generation. There is no rationality to it. Yet some we perpetuated it so well. Yet the SDG systems are not addressed. It addresses equality, but it does not address a systematic failure of the elite of a society to manage a nation as a democracy. For me, is that a larger question or is it, can I save a few tigers? Or can I save 6% of the forest? If I look back and say in some of the best areas where water conservation, resource conservation has happened, is that caste systems have actually been perpetuated more deeply than any other place. Would I want to break those natures? Would I want to break those relationships? And why should I not? Because if I don't, somebody else will. And you see that are people in the society elsewhere. So How do you see planning processes currently? Um, you're looking at the dependence of the economic activity on natural resources. How do you see the planning process currently being? being able to do that at the national level and at the state level. Um, especially uh, then accounting for budgeting and assessing public expenditure, taking into account, even if they don't want to be accounted for, the natural resources. Conventionally, we've always kind of juxtaposed the distributional and ethical concerns against economics. Somehow that has been the conventional approach to looking at these, you know, and I think, um, but that I think has been partly because one of my key concerns is that we have failed to really co-produce knowledge in our society. So producers and users of knowledge, knowledge that can bring, you know, uh, that can inform solutions and then be implemented, can be taken up. That is where I think we have failed across the board. I think the way forward would be to get out of this thing of wearing multiple hats at different points in time. You need to take that hat and compartmentalize it instead. It's one hat. So I would say that, you know, for instance, you asked about, you raised the issue of planning. But can we really say that there is this one way of doing planning which would somehow solve all our concerns? It isn't, even in a localized context. I, would sh I, I have not seen good examples where planning for, under, for water, access to water, can be solved with the same approach. Yes, and I'm not so sure that it that isn't necessarily the best way forward when you're trying to actually, you know, get at a whole range of targets within as quick a time as possible, right? Within a, and the other big issue with planning is, of course, which is linked to accounting, is the issue of resources. Here, one is the whole issue of counting, of bringing externalities in, and if we are putting everything in economic terms. Um, we have a range of um, uh, trading things, or putting up putting up assets for trade, which are not supposed to be put for trade. So I think 
what we're not talking about is commodifying the resources that they're dependent upon from using a language of economics. That's not the intention. We are looking at recognizing the flows of services coming from some of these natural resources that are benefiting those ecosystems and the people who live in them. And just by making that more recognizable in a language that we understand which happens to be expressed in monetary terms is what I think the focus there is rather than saying that this is worth so much and this area is worth so much and then there's no more sensitivity beyond that. So I that we really fought for was that we said we will not value biodiversity. That over there you have to practice a precautionary principle. And we said that you cannot have the polluter phase principle coming in on biodiversity because we do not have the tools to value biodiversity. It's extremely inadequate. So we fought for it and I think we got that little bit out of it only. I do see hope. If each of us in this room asks ourselves whether we've made any progress, we would say it's inadequate progress. We would say it's slow progress. But I don't think we would deny that there has been some progress. I have this problem with mainstreaming culture. You know, trying to get culture into some kind of a box. Um, so I'm completely in agreement with you on that point. And, uh, because society is very heterogeneous, no matter how you cut it, whether you cut it in terms of economics, whether economic well-being, if you cut it in terms of caste, it's very heterogeneous. So let's not try and put any kind of you uniformity on it in terms of and then couch it or justify it in terms of saying, no, no, this is the best, this is the best way for you because the maximum numbers within you are going to achieve something by all following a certain cultural conformity. So when you come to think about our poor United country, because it's got so much potential, this country is so, so potentially great that one cries to think of why we haven't been able to achieve one tenth of our potential. One really has to understand that uh, there are different audiences, there are different people that you can talk to. So when Kavya talks about metrics and measurement and quantification, she's doing so because I think intuitively she's understood that the country is run by people who are influenced by people who can only think in one way. And those are the funnest who advise our ministers and our prime ministers. And you've got to talk to them in languages they understand. And what is the language they understand? They understand money. So she spent a good part of her life trying to show that preserving ecosystem services, preserving nature, preserving the biosphere uh, is actually good for the economy. I think it's a very important thing. But to value systems, to our own identification as human beings and part of civilization comes from nature. So we're not even counting on that. We're just counting how much is the water, the fresh water, that nature gives us for free, without charging us a penny for it, how much is that worth in our lives? Of course, the oxygen is worth so much that it is completely outside the realm of calculation in terms of that. It's infinite. But there are many things that nature does which can be added up, and she and her group have been basically doing that. But it's nothing. It's true that knowing how much nature gives you and makes your value systems, uh, your, your, your economy work. And by the way, just out of interest, I must tell you that numerous studies, including the ones that Tiva's done, show that nature actually produces at least three, if not more times, the value that the human economy produces for the human economy. So we're talking about very big contributions to our lives for which we don't pay a penny. So, keeping that in mind, one must also recognize the limits. Because remember, nature has a right to exist, <coughs> to itself. It's God's creation. Even if you can measure its value, uh, that's nowhere near one millionth of one millionth of one millionth percent of its real value, which is that it's the only nature we got. So. There are things that we value because they're valuable. And Mahatma did say that you've got to be the change you want to see. But I think 
The most important thing he said was, put in the last first and go there. And you know, you're not going to you're not going to change the inequalities of our country, the caste-driven and, uh, and incredible inequities that we've acquired over the last five thousand years, without making a real effort to throw them all out of the window by understanding that it is not possible to have what you call progress if there's even one person who's left behind. From my experience, it's really about the fact that we can keep talking about um, how do we address in the long term equity and poverty and, and our global frameworks adequately taking into account the realities of countries like India and, and the differences that we have at a state level, at a district level, at a village level. But I think those debates can continue. I think what's really important is to see the existing tools and realistic, tangible options that already exist that have been implemented in countries. They are not answers to everything. They are certainly not going to address every uh, topic that we talked about today. But it's important for us to at least start working with those. Said that if you look at the macro indicators, we've progressed. We've set certain targets and we've achieved them. But there are subgroups and subpopulations and subregions which have been completely left out of that. And till we address that, we will always be lagging in terms of being inclusive. So I would like to make that distinction that what I was talking about was that economic progress is something we can still think we will achieve because we will reach that 2100 calories and we will say we have ensured this for everybody. But what we will therefore have to now try and achieve is social progress. Okay, I think a collective attempt to map how the economic flows are happening in the new regime. Now one is a anger with the way that it works as you say about schemes etc it shall continue to be but we i think in the last two years of this tectonic shift we even stopped mapping how these schemes were operating simply because the mapping process becomes decentralized now the states are spending money on health education etc so there's nobody sitting in delhi even collecting that macro data to understand how it's going at the same level the physical relationship is altering i think we have failed and it will help events impact on us in five years time when we sit together and say we have a 2030 plan that does not match actually how our governance runs. I think with that, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> may I have a round of applause for our